Okay, and the last thing I think I really have time to tell you about is uh, a study which we've just published, actually, on another clonal complex uh, of, of Staph aureus, called CC121, which is one of the major uh, global causes of human infection, tends to be associated with skin uh, and soft tissue infections in, in, in humans, such as staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome that you can see here affecting this infant, impetigo. They tend to have mobile genetic ailments which encode for particular toxins known as exfoliative toxins, which result in these kind of nasty uh, symptoms. But of interest is the fact that in the rabbit farming industry, we see, we also see uh, CC121 strains. Okay, so we've got another example here of a multi-host association for a, for a clonal complex of Staph aureus. And there seems to be one particular strain which is responsible for a lot of these uh, epidemics which we see in, in rabbit farms. <coughs> so in rabbits, the ST121s cause uh, mastitis and skin abscesses. So those are the kind of types of infections that we see. And they have been defined as kind of a high virulent strain because they really do seem to spread very rapidly in these rabbit farms and cause quite nasty and progressive uh, skin infections. So, uh, similar to the CC97 story, we want to try and understand the relatedness of these rabbit and human strains and how they may, may have evolved. Um, so this is another phylogenetic tree, similar to the last one that you saw, based on whole genome sequencing of, of CC121 isolates. And we see something similar to, to what we did before. Uh, in blue, uh, in this case, are the uh, human strains, and in red, the rabbit strains that we included in the analysis. So the rabbit strains, in this case, are more closely related to each other than they are to human strains. And there's much greater diversity, <coughs> as you can see by the long branches associated with the, the human strains. So again, we would predict that the ancestral uh, state for CC121 uh, was human but that there's been a host jump event which has happened somewhere along this branch um, into rabbits, which is then followed by adaptation to rabbits and, and then onward spread in, in rabbit uh, populations. Okay, and what you see here on the right hand side, these columns here represent different mobile genetic elements. So we, what we have what we call the core genome for Staph aureus, which is all of the shared uh, coding information and, and uh, non-coding inform uh, sequence information for strains across the whole species. And then what we call the accessory genome, which is kind of strain-dependent genetic information. And those are largely the mobile genetic elements, which are, can move around between different strains and allow them to adapt to different uh, environments or to different host species. So in this case, if we look at the human strains, we can see uh, a, a, a variety of different mobile genetic elements, many of them encoding for virulence determinants, so factors which contribute to pathogenesis and causing disease in, in human hosts. And uh, then what we see though, when we look at the accessory genome, so look at the mobile genetic elements for the rabbit strains, we don't really see any. And this is a big surprise to us because if we when we looked previously at bovine strains and sheep strains, uh, and particularly in the poultry strains, we saw a unique set of mobile genetic elements, which we think are very important in adaptation of those strains to those particular host species. But so we were quite surprised to see that the rabbit strains don't have their own set of mobile genetic elements. So that begs the question, well, how are they adapting to rabbits since the host jump if they don't have those elements? So we assume that then what must have happened is that there are mutations which have occurred since the host jump event, so happened along this branch here, which are really important for the adaptation of Staph aureus to, to rabbits. And we know that when we look at the genome sequence, we see a bunch of mutations that have happened. Some of them are associated with loss of, of function. Some of those are with change of, of function. And 
without wanting to go into the uh, long-winded uh, description of, of exactly what we did, we found by muta introducing some of these mutations into a human strain or reversing these mutations uh, in a rabbit strain, we were able to kind of narrow down what were the important mutations in allowing these strains to colonize and infect rabbits. And moving on to this slide, what we did was we took a rabbit strain of ST121 and human strain of ST121 and we experimentally infected rabbits. Okay, so we established skin infections which are very similar to the natural type of skin infections that these rabbit strains cause. And we can see that it's only the, only the rabbit strains can actually cause infections experimentally in these rabbits and the human strains can't. So there's very clearly an adaptation which allows these uh, rabbit strains to infect rabbits. And <coughs> what we've worked out essentially is that there's a single nucleotide mutation which happened in one gene and changed the uh, derived amino acid sequence uh, for uh, for the protein encoded by that, that gene, which was sufficient and required to allow that uh, strain of SD1 to 1 to infect rabbits. We're not sure exactly what the basis for that is, why, how that works, but we're working to figure that out at the moment, but it's a mutation which happens in this gene here, encoding for predicted membrane protein uh, called DLTB, which is involved in adding dialanine residues to uh, major surface components of Staph aureus, water-tachoic acid and lipid-tachoic uh, acids. So it's probably involved in resistance to something that's produced by, by the host, so antimicrobial peptides or something, something like that. We're not quite clear. But I think what it just shows you really is how readily, in theory, some bacteria can adapt to overcome the kind of physiological and anatomical barriers um, to infection of a very different uh, host species. This is a phylogenetic tree, which was not done by, by our group, but by uh, another group based in Cambridge, run by, by Mark Holmes. And it's just really to show you how we can use these kind of whole genome sequence-based phylogenies, apart from giving us lots of information about the evolution of particular uh, bacteria and how they adapt to different host species, it could potentially be useful for understanding the transmission chain within epidemics. So trying to understand uh, who got what from, from who. This is getting back to your question about the direction of the host jump. It's actually very difficult uh, in many cases to definitively identify the source of transmission of a particular uh, infection. So this was uh, a farm, or two different farms in, in Cambridgeshire, uh, where they went in and they sampled the animals on, the, on these farms. And uh, because there had been the case of, of skin, human skin infections uh, associated with these different farms. So they're able to do whole genome sequencing of the livestock and human strains in order to identify the relatedness of those strains. So you can see two different clusters here. These patients, uh, these two colonies from this particular patient here, very closely related to a strain which was obtained from, uh, from cow A. Uh, in this case here we had a strain from patient B which was very closely related to Staph aureus strains from sheep. So that's all you can infer really is that you can say, well, the likelihood is that that person got that infection from livestock on the farm. We can't definitively pro prove the direction of, of transmission. So it could, in theory, have been the human who acquired it from somewhere else and then passed it on uh, to the livestock. But the most parsimonious or likely explanation is that they acquired it from livestock on, on the farm. But it's fraught uh, with difficulties in interpreting these kinds of data. And there's a lot of effort now going into how we can use these kinds of sequence information to um, identify what the source of an outbreak might be, for example, particularly in, in the hospital setting. 
Okay, I do have some other slides, but I think I'm going to leave it at that. I think that's quite enough information for you for one day.